So I think for me, one measure of success of of uh, Cunetic will be, you know, one one day in the future when we hear that they they switched off in one country or in the last country at different times in the future, they switched off the last fossil fuel power station, something like that. Or it, it was switched off for a day at least, you know, something like this. What's going on, everybody? And welcome back to the Next Big Thing podcast. I'm Brendan. He's Connor. And today we're joined by an awesome guest, Michael Pratt, the co-founder and CEO of Cunetic. It is an ener- uh, Cunetic is an energy storage startup whose mission is to help unlock a fossil fuelless civilization so that humanity can fully transition to renewable energy. That being said, Mike, thanks for your time and welcome on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate being here. So, Mike, when you're, uh, whenever you're ready, let's go right into it and uh, tell us a little bit about Cunetic. Okay, so as you mentioned, um, our whole mission is to help civilization transition from fossil fuels onto a sustainable economy. Okay, so how do we do that? We've got three steps, quite simple, electrify everything. Uh, and then we have to get all that electricity from renewable sources, solar and wind. And then the third part, which is really the missing piece, is we need massive amounts of energy storage. So that's what Kinetic is providing. So why do we need energy storage? Well, basically, supply and demand don't match. So from time to time, you'll have insufficient supply. And if we have enough energy storage, we can uh, charge when we have sufficient power and then discharge when we need it. And this is called energy shifting. And you need to do this on uh, the 24 hour cycle, which means we need a system that can discharge twice a day and can discharge for long enough that we can actually serve that 24 hour cycle. But today we have insufficient systems. Lithium ion batteries, well, they degrade from the very first cycle and you have to replace them. Pump storage hydropower is very good, but it just doesn't scale. You can't mass produce that. Uh, flow batteries aren't efficient enough, so therefore they're expensive. And then things like gravity storage are just huge and take up a huge amount of material as well. By the way, these two things are actually mechanical storage. Uh, they're still considered maybe a battery, but they're mechanical storage, which is exactly what Kinetic is doing. So this is our vision of the future where we have um, a, a Kinetic battery outside every town and city. So our product is these these are little uh, domes you can see. So underneath these domes is this. This is a, you're looking at a motor and generator and bearing system of our system, but that's above ground. What's below ground is this. So this huge flywheel energy storage system. So what is that? It's basically a mechanical battery. So what we have is the black part is the bit that stores our energy and it stores the energy as uh, kinetic energy. It's as basically a spinning element. And then we suspend that with a magnetic bearing. So we don't have any mechanical losses. And then we get the electricity in and out using a motor generator. So here you can see a hundred of those systems connected to form a grid scale battery responding to supply and demand of the grid. So we installed it underground to make it intrinsically safe in the cheapest way possible. And we have this thin concrete skin to allow us to install it in the ground. And then we take in uh, renewable energy from solar and wind and put that through a motor that converts that into kinetic energy. And then we accumulate the energy in the rotor. The faster it goes, the more energy we're storing. And we can hold that energy for a really long time because we have a vacuum inside the chamber and we have these magnetic bearings. That means we have no contact. And then to get the energy back out, we simply reverse the process and the momentum of the rotor drives the motor and now acts as a generator and we discharge the system. So it's actually beautifully simple, but actually very, very effective. Okay, so that's the product. What does it achieve? Three things. First of all, it's huge. The capacity of Kinetic is um, many times more than uh, existing technologies. They're just a few percentage points of where we're going with Kinetic. So it's like the jumbo jet of flywheel energy storage. The second thing is that it's super low cost in terms of capex and also in terms of what's really important, which is levelized cost of storage. Uh, it significantly undercuts lithium ion. It's half the price of lithium ion. And the third thing that's most important to us is that it displaces fossil fuel emissions. Each system can displace four tons a day over 20 or 30 years of its lifetime. That's really significant. So this is the, the leadership team that's going to get us there. Um, myself, my background is product design and development. So I know about taking requirements and figuring out how to take a product from there to uh, into production. My co-founder is the, the guy uh, with the glasses. So his background is actually rotating machinery. He's an expert in this type of product, previously in gas turbines and then in wind turbines. And he's really the genius behind 
uh, the, the fundamentals of, of Qnetic. And then joining us, we have uh, Matthias and Malcolm, both very senior guys, one from the engineering background and uh, working in renewables, and uh, Malcolm from uh, finance and business background. So we've really got quite a sort of powerhouse team behind us. And the market is exploding. We've got a, um, a market that's doubling every three years, and we're only 1% of the way through installing all of the energy storage that we need in the world. So if we jump through, forward a few years, 2030, we are intending to have about a thousand units a year in production, which actually is not that many considering the demand. Uh, it's only a few percentage points of the total demand. Um, and therefore uh, we had a big company to, to get us there. So um, we're expecting by that point, we're gonna have a company worth over a billion dollars. So we've got um, two major stages that we want to talk about right now. The alpha one stage that uh, we're funding right now, and then the alpha two stage that we, we want to get funding for later on this year. Alpha one stage is our first prototype and alpha two stage is our big full scale prototype that we're gonna put into pilot sites and from that generate demand. And um, the alpha one stage is fundraising right now, that's live on WeFunder. So we're about three quarters of a billion dollars through our fundraise. And then for the next fundraise for alpha two, for the big scale prototypes, it's gonna take about uh, $5 million. So we're looking for VC funding for that right now as well. And finally, on uh, recent news, we have um, filed our first patent not, not long ago. Uh, that covers the bearing systems. That's really important. And uh, excuse me, we've raised nearly three quarters of a million dollars so far on our WeFunder, and we've got interest from several VC firms who are uh, we're expecting an offer from soon. We've just built our ten percent scale model that I'll show you in a sec, and we're right now hiring staff and moving to a new office so we can uh, develop the product. So very finally, here's the uh, ten percent scale model, so you can get a feel of uh, what it looks like as the system is charging and the rotor gets faster and faster. So what we really we need to do next is uh, take that to the next level and build a, a full scale prototype. That was great, Mike. Um, so that definitely uh, created a lot of questions and uh, <laughs> an awesome product. Um, so I'll get it started by saying this. Um, it seems like the path to um, renewables being uh, and having a fossil fuel civilization has been a slow one. Um, mm. just from an outsider's perspective. Uh, what makes right now, why is the market prepared for Kunetic right now and, and why is the market ready for it? Um, well, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think 10 years ago, nobody was really talking about uh, storage on the grid and then that paradigm has changed. I think the, honestly, I think the, um, the kind of leader that started to change people's minds in that area was, was Tesla and with their power pack and, and mega pack systems demonstrated that it was feasible to build something of that type for, for the grid. But actually energy storage has been around for a really long time. It was originally um, sort of made useful by uh, the nuclear power industry because nuclear power just runs constantly all the time. Um, so at nighttime, you need somewhere to put that energy. So they built the um, pump storage hydropower systems in order to absorb that energy at nighttime. So it's not like it's a really new thing. It's just that um, we're now looking for, like I said, scalable solutions. So now lithium ion seems feasible for a scalable solution, but it's still actually too expensive, doesn't last long enough. Um, and demand is, as I showed, uh, escalating. So it means the eyes are looking in different places for different technologies. And there's a lot of money going into uh, research, researching better technologies uh, to enable grid scale storage. But honestly, we can't really see enough good options. And uh, we really hope that we're going to play a part in, in providing some of that storage. Um, actually, the, the demand is so big and the, the need is so important that we think there's not going to be uh, like one product or one type of storage that's going to solve it all. It's going to be a multitude of different companies trying to fulfill the huge demand. So what made you want to do uh, flywheel technology? Because flywheel technology isn't that isn't a new technology that just came out of, out of the blue. It's been established for a little bit. So why flywheel? Um, OK, well, actually, what happened is myself and my co-founder, we, we started a company. We had no idea what it was going to do at the beginning. And we just knew we wanted to do something that was going to be beneficial for the future of life on earth. It was really that broad. And we actually sat down and we brainstormed all sorts of things. 
and we looked at like heating and cooling and uh, how we could improve the way we run our homes. Uh, we looked at health. We looked at very wide ranging stuff. And then we started to kind of um, bring that in tighter and tighter onto the things that we felt we we could really do something beneficial on. And because we're both mechanical engineers, um, one of the first things we decided to spend some time on was the idea of flywheel energy storage. Um, and actually, if you do the back of the napkin math, it, it looks a bit hopeless, honestly. Why um, is that? Um, so the, the products already on the market are basically too expensive and they are somewhat limited in their performance. Um, but for example, um if you if you take some of the products that are out there today that are meant for the grid and you think well what's the problem with this okay it's too expensive uh, it doesn't store enough energy you need like thousands of these um for the equivalent of a few hundred uh, or a few dozen mega packs say okay how do we scale this up and the answer you would you'd come to is that it doesn't make sense to scale it up because of the the archetype of the system the fact the rotor is made of metal uh, it's extremely heavy uh, if you scale it up, then it gets very, very heavy. You have huge losses. It's very expensive. So you'd think, mm, this is not really worthwhile. But um, what we did is kind of go back to square one and really think about it from um, two things, really the, the engineering science. And the other thing is realizing there's a new type of requirement. Previously, flywheels are used for kind of fast response um, backup power, things like this, short duration, um, high power, relatively small amount of energy. But we were thinking about, well, how do we convert the whole grid onto renewables? Well, it's a different set of requirements. You need huge capacity, you need long duration. So we asked that question, can flywheels do this? And um, it's not till you really kind of dig a bit deeper and start to really think about new ways of approaching it that you come up with the answer, actually, yes, you can do that. Um, but it's non-obvious, actually. There's some interesting bits of engineering there that that uh, that we've reached that enable a system that can be significantly cheaper and much higher performance than what we can see out there at the moment. So, are there any right, we have are there any uh, toxic so, byproducts in manufacturing these high-strength fibers for kinetic batteries using the um, flywheel technology? Not really, but carbon fiber is at the moment quite energy-intensive material, and um, now that's a kind of long-term goal of ours that we can source carbon fiber or even make our own carbon fiber that is um, as close as possible carbon zero. So we get all the energy to manufacture it from solar, let's say. Um, but at the moment, yeah, it's relatively energy intense material. But um, it's a bit like the same thing with lithium ion batteries or electric cars. Actually, if you look at the, the full lifetime cost of the system, the fact that its purpose is to displace fossil fuels actually it's it's kind of massively carbon negative if you think about it in that sense so the it justifies itself but yeah i would love to use uh, carbon fiber that is low or, or zero carbon intensity and also we have the good thing about the design is because it uses fibers actually it's fiber agnostic we could use whatever fiber that might come along in the future that could be stronger or cheaper or different versions of carbon fiber or glass fiber or anything else that could be the optimum um ratio of cost to strength okay so, so there's the potential for you know to change and fluctuate a little bit and hopefully get closer to the what uh net zero carbon goal right because i do have a question why hasn't many batteries been focusing on the four to 12 hour range hmm. um it's actually going to be a bit of a progression um Actually, the DOE has a nice study on this where they talk about the four stages of uh, energy storage. Um, almost all of the energy storage that's being installed right now is just doing two things. It's doing frequency regulation and it's doing peaking capacity. So these are like um, kind of emergency levers you can pull to stabilize the grid. But that's not what Kinetic is about. And that's not what... Uh, the biggest application of storage is going to be. The biggest application is what I described as daily energy shifting. This is where you have, what well, the characteristic of the grids all around the world is that typically you have one or two cycles per day of demand. One peak in the morning and then another peak in the evening. And in the middle of the day, it kind of stabilizes a bit. Obviously at nighttime, it drops down to almost nothing. So you need to solve that problem to enable us to use solar and wind. 
Um, now, right now, batteries aren't really doing that. And the problem with lithium ion is that the economics tail off somewhat after about four hours. Now you can install like eight hour lithium ion systems, but the way they do it is by putting way more cells in there um, in order to achieve it and having kind of redundancy, which just builds the cost up. So it can be done. There's no technical reason why not. It's just a cost question. But uh, this issue doesn't really face kinetic. You can, you can discharge it four hours, six hours, eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours. And the only thing that changes is you start to drop a few percentage points of the overall um, round trip efficiency. So you talked in your elevator pitch about uh, your product kind of life cycle. So you're about, I think, a year or so away from a minimum viable product. Um, right. Have you guys done any brainstorming as to who your core customer is going to be? Uh, you talked a lot about the demand. So who, who what uh, customers are you going to be going after first? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So um, we're really expecting kind of multitude customers. There's going to be... Um, uh, distribution grid operators. Um, so it's not transmission operators. This is you know distribution. So uh, the kind of consumption side. It would also be power producers themselves. So solar and wind producers who already have those assets. If they add storage, then they can amplify the profitability of their assets. So that's one major user, and that's probably going to be our first type of customer. But then beyond that is going to be um, developers. So these are they tend to be sort of technology agnostic, but will still have their sort of favorite relationships and favorite products they like to integrate. Um, so that might be a harder win because actually one of the problems that we're going to face as a company is that at the moment, nobody really believes that flywheel energy storage has a part to play. Everyone's really focused on lithium ion. Okay, how much can we squeeze lithium ion and get more and more, or, or reduce the cost and get more and more performance out of lithium ion? Uh, totally new battery technologies uh, like uh, sodium batteries and other things like uh, flow batteries. But there's not yet a conversation around uh, flywheel energy storage. So that's that's an issue for us. We need to sort of break that bias. And um, that's what's really important about that MVP and putting those into pilot size is so that we can show people that the product really does what we say it can do and for the performance and cost that we've uh, been talking about. Uh, so if we can do that, then the developers, I think, is going to also going to be another key customer. So that just reminded me of something I wanted to ask you. Um, I've found just, again, an average person, that one of the biggest things surrounding public perception in energy is people are stubborn to change. And you kind of just touched on it with, okay, people looking at lithium ion, but not flywheel. H how are you trying to break that mold? I guess, Kunetic? How is Kunetic trying to break that mold? And make flywheel technology, uh, put it out there. And number two, as a greater grand scheme of things, how can the energy industry sort of break through that stubbornness that uh, people might be having? What we're finding is that the people that we're speaking to actually get quite excited by kinetic because it's new and different and a bit unusual. So. The pilot sites that I mentioned, uh, we're finding it's actually, um, we're getting some encouraging responses from people when we talk about trying to find places to install a product. So we've got one lined up in North Germany. There's a place called uh, Burger Wind Park Janavi. So they test wind turbines and they've agreed to uh, install kinetic there and test it, connect it to their, to their wind turbines and the grid. Uh, and we have another place in, in, in Southern France. It's have a solar, solar site there. And we're just discussing with them about installing it. So we're finding that these, um, these kind of niche users are very interested, actually. So I think as long as we can show the tech working um, and the fact that the demand is so high that we think we'll, we'll start to uh, find users who are willing to, to uh, kind of explore, if you like, and, and take a chance on, on a new technology. That's why it's so important to demonstrate it. Um, so you mentioned that the demand is so high. What do you think the key obstacles are right now with the world becoming a green energy world? Okay, so it's really about cost fundamentally. And that, that kind of turns into a few different tales. If I look at, say, Europe, there's a big discussion in Europe right now about how to construct a market for energy storage. 
Um, there's there's a quite a well-established market for um, you know renewables, and there's been uh, subsidies and pricing policies to help encourage renewables. But there isn't yet the same thing for storage. And should it be necessary, or why is it necessary? Well, okay, the fundamental problem is that if you take energy produced by renewables, it is, it is the cheapest form of energy. But then once you put that into a storage system and then discharge it back out again to the grid, it's gone up a lot in price because you have to pay for the storage system and you have to pay for the losses of the system. Okay, so the um, the energy that comes out of a storage system needs to include the cost to produce it, the cost of the storage system and the cost of losses. And then the total uh, you know, finished price there needs to be cheaper than fossil fuel energy. That's actually your, your test. At the moment, that's not the case. So there's not a strong enough incentive to switch off fossil fuel power plants um, and install more energy storage. Um, so that needs to be, that needs a bit of work. There needs to be some policies or frameworks in place to shift the balance. It doesn't need a lot of shifting. It just needs shifting a little bit so that it's always advantageous to be using stored renewable power rather than burning new fossil fuels to create power. So that's something that they're working on in Europe and else around the world, I guess there's similar policies, but that's that's one really key thing that needs to be in place. Is a lot of energy lost when uh, using an energy storage system with the current models? Yeah. Um, typically, you're not going to get back more than about 85%. And um, in the case of Cunetic, what happens is the AC power comes in, it goes through a, a AC, DC, AC converter, and then it goes through the motor generator. Now, each of those is like 97, 98% efficient. So it's very good. But once you multiply these percentages together and you consider some losses within the, the rotor, you'll get about 86% back. It doesn't sound that great, but that's exactly the same as lithium ion batteries. Lithium ion batteries have heat losses and uh, you know, there's other losses in the system that mean that you only get a round, round trip efficiency of about 85 or 86% from lithium ion. Um, and there's, I don't really think there's many other systems that, that are doing better than that. So that's the kind of best thing in class. And some are much worse, like um, vanadium redox flow batteries that are uh, proposed as being good for long duration. Actually, the round trip efficiency is going to be 60 or 70%. So that's quite a significant cost. If you throw away 40% of your energy each time you charge and discharge, it's quite significant. Um, and even pump storage hydropower has a similar kind of efficiency. Maybe it's gonna be 80%, something like that. So efficiency is a big deal. If you can just climb a few percentage points up from you know 84 to 87 or whatever, then you're doing well. So you're not trying to, it's kind of not feasible to expect to go from 85 to 95%. With the new technology, you want to slowly, it's incremental gains each year, figuring out how to improve the technology slowly. Yeah, now that's the exactly. with the flywheel technology, it since it's kinetic energy, it's spinning the energy around instead of using chemicals. So it doesn't have to deal with a lot of the hazardous uh, situations that lithium ion batteries have to deal with, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, actually, the whole lithium ion materials question is been getting bigger and bigger over the last couple of years um, for several reasons. First of all, origin. Um, previously, there's a lot of complaints around where the cobalt comes from, how it's mined, for example. Um, potential like uh, environmental issues where lithium lakes are in um, Chile and so on. And, um, and also disposal of the batteries. So these are all issues under discussion. And then the additional one beyond that is that now we're relying more and more on lithium ion batteries for our vehicles and for stationary storage. But where does it come from in terms of supply chain? Well, 80% of it goes through China. So there's not much independence of energy security going forwards. Now, this is a major concern, which is why the US and Europe are scrambling to build you know, gigafactories to produce their own lithium ion batteries and all the electrode materials and so on. Now, Kinetic doesn't have that problem. The key material, which is about 60% of the cost of the system, carbon fiber, you can source that in North America, in Europe, in China, and basically the cost is about the same in all those places. So we don't have these supply chain constraints, the supply chain bottlenecks. The only thing that, um, that specifically comes from China would be the, the magnets in the, in the bearing system, who actually we use quite a relatively small amount of magnets overall, so it's not a big supply chain issue. And also those new 
supply chain coming online in Australia and elsewhere that avoids this kind of rare earth mining problem also being a bottleneck through China. So you mentioned China, you mentioned Europe, you mentioned the US. Everybody's scrambling, it seems like now, to uh, get ahead in this race to renewable energy, if it's, we wanted to call it that. Uh, how do you see right. it playing out? How long do you see, how, how long do you think it's going to be before it becomes a widely um, accepted and used way to use energy? And who do you think is going to win or be the first there? Yeah, okay. Well, um, I think you know, these things happen um, gradually, then suddenly. You know, that's a, a kind of the layman's characteristic of an exponential, and that's what we're in. So I think by the time we get to the second half of this decade, um, we're going to see massive deployments of energy storage everywhere, and it'll be doing longer and longer duration. I mentioned these four stages, and we just have frequency regulation and peaking capacity. Well, the next the next stage is... Uh, daily energy shifting. And um, I think that's going to become commonplace very quickly in this in this decade. Uh, who's going to win? Well, like I said, there's no one technology that's going to um, continue to dominate. It's lithium ion today. Actually, that is our competitor, lithium ion. 92% of the market for energy storage is covered by lithium ion batteries. Um, and then the last 8% is basically everybody else. So we want to kind of take that last 8% and, and make it bigger and have more different types of technologies uh, uh, competing to win some market share. Um, but long term, I think what we're going to see is um, lithium ion keeping the short duration, uh, hydrogen energy storage taking the long duration, so this is 12 hours and upwards, and products like Kinetic taking that in-between period that does the daily energy shifting. So we'll see a kind of simplification and stratification of all the different technologies as we go forward. But really our goal is to try and accelerate as quickly as we can to get the product ready so that we can start to scale it to, to meet demand. How does Kinetic's battery compare to the lithium ion batteries when it comes to costs? Yeah, okay. So um, as I mentioned in the pitch, what matters really is what's called levelized cost. Um, there's really two numbers that any customer cares about, which is the, the capex, so how much do I have to pay to install this system, and then what's the levelized cost. Um, by levelized cost, Kinetic is half the price of lithium-ion batteries. Now, between now and the end of the decade, there's a cost decline that's quite well established for lithium-ion batteries. Even if we include that cost decline, it's going to be uh, like 60% more expensive to install lithium-ion compared to Kinetic, and this is putting aside any possible cost decline for Kinetic. So actually, we're quite confident in the low cost of the system. We're being quite conservative with our cost models there, and um, yeah, we we, uh, we actually expect that long term we have our own ways of cutting a lot of cost out of the system, and uh, remain competitive for long term. I wanted to circle back to something you talked about earlier. Um... And I think it was in your elevator pitch, which was about how you and uh, Louis, I don't, uh, is that, am I pronouncing his, his name yes. correctly? Yes. He, uh, you guys created a company that came up with its mission first and right. then the product. Do you think right. that's helped you guys in any way, made you more prepared in any way? I'm interested. Yeah, massively. I would say that's my number one advice to any entrepreneur uh, starting yeah. a company. What I figured out is that people is greater than mission is greater than product. I think a lot of people um, try to come up with their killer product idea and then go, oh, I've got it right now. I can start my company around this idea. Well, it's kind of back to front. Really what you want to do is figure out your, get your people in place first of all. Now that probably starts with yourself, right? If you're ready to engage in a startup you know you're the first kind of person but two heads is better than one for sure and if you've got somebody to always discuss your ideas with refine your ideas um kind of share the burden if you like that's super important and then if you can figure out your mission before your product i mean they're related of course so you might have an idea where your product is going but honestly your product is going to change 10 times between when you come up with your idea and when you actually get close to market so don't worry too much about the you know exact specifics of the product get your mission straight 
And then actually, if you've got your mission straight, then all the rest of the questions you want to ask kind of get much easier to answer. So for example, initially we were looking at a flywheel energy storage system that was kind of small and would suit a residential home. So a bit like a Tesla uh, Powerwall kind of paradigm. And we thought, well, is that really gonna solve the transition to renewable power? Why are we trying to solve it like house by house by house? Wouldn't we better going to the fundamentals of the energy system? Um, so it meant that we, that was the wrong hole to be digging. We should be building a huge system and connect it to the grid. And then we can, you can change the energy system for a whole community of homes in one go. So that drove us in that direction because we knew that that was the mission we were trying to solve. And another example would be um, uh, like what kind of company we're we building. If we're trying to solve for uh, climate change, well, this is a global issue. So it means you need to solve the problem on a, on a global level. There's no point just focusing on uh, Europe or just focusing on the US or what have you. You need to think about all the major territories around the world. So it means, okay, you've got to go and build a big company. You need to start manufacturing in Europe. You've got to manufacture in, in the US and you've got to manufacture in China. You've got to cover the whole planet. So that's a daunting proposition because it means you, you've got to go from being a startup and think about scaling into a, a big multinational corporation. Okay, well, if that's what it takes, then you know, if, if that's what it takes to fulfill the mission, that's what we have to do. So that's what led us down that path. It's super important. It's super uh, powerful way of thinking. Get your mission straight and it guides everything else. So you, I can't agree more with what you're saying. And uh, it's one of the biggest things that stuck out to me. Uh, when I was listening to a couple of things, other things you've done. Um, it also came up when I was looking over those things, how diverse your executive team is. You have a Frenchman, a German, you have a CFO who's from a different part of the world. Was that kind of in the back of your mind when you were building that executive team? You talked about solving a global problem, having a global executive team, people in all, from all walks of life, all different parts of the world. Um, I wouldn't say deliberately, no, um, but that does form a, quite a nice piece, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, Malcolm is a U.S. citizen, but uh, uh, he was born, I think he might have been born in India, but grew up in the Middle East. Uh, so he's got kind of a uh, sort of slightly varied background. And yeah, Matthias being based in Germany is actually extremely helpful. Um, so we connected with with both of those guys originally as advisors, but um, once they kind of got their teeth into what we were doing, um, they were sufficiently attracted to, to join us full time. And honestly, this was amazing for us because those guys are both very senior, very experienced, um, and both previously working in you know very high paid roles in senior positions. And it doesn't make a lot of sense for them to kind of join a small startup that's high risk and um, uncertainty. Um, but I think they were captured by by the mission and um, and the opportunity it presented. It's, it's quite ex exciting. So that's great great for us to to, to know that's the case. But um, in particular, Matthias being located in Germany is super helpful because he's been working in wind turbine industry for a couple of decades. So he's very well connected to all of the supply chain, um, a lot of expertise and network in in Germany. So through him, we have connections to manufacturers for the rotor, um, for balancing of the rotor. This is a very important engineering aspect. Also, he's our connection to the Berger Wind Park Janabi, where we'll be doing testing later. So that's been very helpful. Yeah, very helpful indeed. With founding such a mission-driven company, what makes you want to get up every single morning? <laughs> um... Actually, I think it's probably different for different people in the company. For me and Luig, we are quite motivated by really the engineering design challenge. Um, you know, build, building a big company or building a company generally is, is exciting and interesting. But I think neither of us really see ourselves as, um, you know, kind of like... Um, you know, kings of a castle kind of thing, just sitting at the top of a big company that we built. That's not really what, what we care about. What we care about is building an awesome product that does something really well and get that out into the world. So we're quite excited and motivated by building the prototype, um, working on the engineering challenge with all other people that we assemble to, to solve these problems. And in particular, at least for me, it's actually getting the product to be successful. If we can 
create this thing and then kind of get it out there into the world and it actually does what we want it to do and build some build some traction and, and actually does move the needle in terms of uh, the transition to renewable power that's that's really highly motivating the kind of success of the thing the product so with that being said what's your vision 10 years 15 years from now for kinetic to be successful um yeah maybe there's more than one way of answering that every now and then you hear a really great bit of news story like for example so i'm from the uk originally and um there was a news story not that long ago where they said that for the first day since like i don't know 1820 or 1850 or something like that we had um not burnt any coal to make electricity so it turns out since at some point during the industrial revolution when they built the first power station on coal it's been running constantly burning coal all the way through those generations until maybe like two years ago when we had like half a day or one day with no coal being burnt okay <laughs> kind of extraordinary thing to imagine but it's a great, bit of great news right because that means that actually the, the the transition to renewable power is working so you do have the opportunity to solve this problem so I think I'm quite motivated by bits of news like that. So I think for me, one measure of success of of uh, Kinetic will be, you know, one one day in the future when we hear that they they switched off in one country or in the last country at different times in the future, they switched off the last fossil fuel power station, something like that, or it, it was switched off for a day at least, you know, something like this. So that would be one measure of success. So the energy storage we install actually does its job of enabling this transition. So that that would be very cool. And then just zooming in on, on kinetic, I feel like the thing that I try to picture um, as a measure of kinetic being successful is uh, a kinetic battery outside every town and city. So if you imagine you have um, a conurbation at some point, you have the transmission lines that come in and it, it comes down through a, um, a sort of transformer or what have you, and then we have the dis distribution network locally. So if you install a battery here, it means that each each town or city can effectively become decarbonized by installing energy adjacent. And it makes more sense to put the energy at the consumer side than the production side, because if you have it on the consumer side, you, you don't have to store electricity that you're then going to um, lose in trans tra uh, transmission. So you, you can store slightly less uh, energy. It's a bit more efficient. Um, yeah, I picture that energy storage outside every town and city. It may not literally be every town and city, but I just like that that picture that makes sense. Because the, the unit, if I, I went flying on an airplane over the UK last time I went in, I was peering out the window, looking at all of these, the night times, all the towns are lit up. And it occurred to me that to decarbonize a whole country, what do you have to do? Okay, well, the sort of unit of that would be to decarbonize each town and city. So how do you do that? Okay, well, if you install energy storage outside each town and city, then you can purchase your energy from like that's that town could choose to purchase its energy from renewable sources because you know the grid is like one big interconnected system right so it doesn't matter where physically your energy comes from as long as it's connected to the same grid so if i was uh you know manchester or something right well i you could set it up so that all the energy was being um received from renew renewable sources so you could kind of decarbonize a town on its own oh that sounds pretty good to me well, if you could take your hometown and decarbonize it, right, by adding uh, energy storage, that sounds great. Oh yeah, no, I, I, uh, me and Connor are we both are always very inspired by entrepreneurs that come on and are mission driven and are really trying to do good in the world. And those are two things that I know you guys are doing at Kinetic. So um, I wanted to thank you so much for your time. I've learned a ton. Uh, definitely don't have a background thank you, Mike. in engineering and uh, this has been an awesome interview. So um, best of luck to you guys at Kinetic and uh, we're going to be rooting for you heavily. And uh, I hope that, you know, one day at my house, I, uh, you know, I get to walk, drive outside my town and I get to see Kinetic storage facilities and, uh, you know, remember this conversation. Yeah. Excellent. Well, that'd be great. Yeah. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me on Brendan and Connor. No we appreciate it. And we'll see you next time on the next big thing. So long. Yeah.